and to Patricia St. Dennis Nitsigason, a minister of women Anglescag, Uchinina. My name is Patricia St. Dennis. I'm from Cumberland House Creation. And I just would like to welcome you to this learning that we are going to be having today. And uh, it is uh, this learning uh, has come about with our food programming that we have set up as an initiative, as a partnership with the University of Saskatchewan, with schools in Saskatoon, the public school division, and then also with our nine nations up here in the Meadow Lake Travel Council. So our all our schools and the learning that we're doing in the partnership is in the land of Treaty 6, 8, and 10. And so I just want to be able to say, enjoy your afternoon, enjoy your learning. And yeah, thank you very much. And um, now we'll have comments from Tammy Shikotko. Hey, and welcome everybody who's joining virtually and in person and who might be viewing later as a recording for this event. So I'd like to um, take some time to just remind everyone we are recording the event. It is live, so uh, just keep that in mind. And I just wanted to let you know a little bit of a background about why we're doing this program. So some of the schools that are part of our program have received these garden towers and this is um, to help us understand how to put them together and assemble them and then how we might use them uh, to get started with them in the classroom. Um, and so I'd like to just introduce Frank Tecklenburg. Te uh, Frank, um, I'm just going to read a little bit if you don't mind. So Frank has moved back from Saskatchewan with his family in 1999. Um, he has a background as an executive chef and division manager with the First Nations Catering Company for many years. And then he began consulting at Flying Dust First Nation with the uh, Flying Dust First Nation Market Garden from 2011 to 13. And there he helped with um, the garden attaining its uh, certification as an organic garden and also with helping uh, the company to uh, find markets for the produce. So Frank, in 2015, became be, uh, became involved in the Earth Connections Company. And since then, they've been providing seeds, gardening products, workshops, and consultation related to soil-based um, growing products throughout yeah. Canada. So, so Frank's been working with yeah. them since 2015. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Frank is introducing these, and so I'll just uh, turn it over to Frank, and he's just going to help us understand how to put this thing together and make good use of it. So welcome, Frank. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming and, and for joining us. Of course, I do acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 um, territory, and we are excited and happy to be able to share the information on the Garden Tower um for you and for your classrooms if you do end up having additional questions you're welcome to uh send those via email i'm sure that tammy can get them to us and we'll make sure that you have a variety of different resources available for you to help you be successful the garden tower is a vertical growing system that incorporates vermicomposting so little red wiggler worms and the purpose of the little red wiggler worms is to provide the nutrients for the plants that are growing within the tower. Um, the red wigglers are, um, what will happen is that you'll be able to provide your greens, your, your leftover um, compost, and put that into the tower itself. And then with browns on top, things like shredded newspaper or shredded cardboard, you'll create an environment where the red wiggler worms will continue to grow. They will eat your compost and as a result, for lack of a better term, they're going to poop out vermicompost, and that vermicompost works exceptionally well in providing nutrients for the plants. Within the tower itself, there's a tube, and you'll notice that within the tube, there are a variety of different holes. This allows the plant roots to make their way into the center column uh, compost tube to be able to draw the nutrients that they need in order to grow and thrive. Um, so for the classrooms and the schools that are, are receiving the garden tower, we thought we'd take a few minutes to show you exactly how to set it up to make you feel more comfortable. Again, all of the instructions are included um, with the tower and they're also available online. 
So if you do have any questions or concerns, you can check online or you can actually um, follow up uh, with, with the group here or give us a call and we're more than happy to be able to help you to become successful. So the garden tower itself um, only rotates 360 degrees, which therefore allows you to not have to walk around the tower in order to harvest or to move forward with it. It's just a lot simpler way um, to be able to harvest your produce on an ongoing basis. The tower itself, I'm just going to turn it upside down. Um, when you receive the package or your, your container, your, these three legs are located within the drawer. So you'll remove those legs from the drawer, put them into the holes uh, of the tower itself, and then just push down to ensure that they are uh, firm and snug. Every tower that's been uh, that's going to the classrooms and the schools also comes with a full caster kit. That allows them to be able to move from either classroom to classroom or over to a watering source when needed in order to be able to um, to give the water to the plants to be able to grow. So we're going to take a couple of minutes here and just do the initial setup of the casters. So there are three bars. They will get set just um, within the legs itself. One, two, and three. You'll notice that there's two holes on one side, one on the other. The one on the other side is for the initial joining of. The other two will line up so that to the holes within the, the legs itself, as well as the area for the casters to be attached. In order to set up the, uh, the caster bars, you'll have your screw with your nut and your washer. You're going to place the screw through the top of all three with the washer on it. And then you'll have a second washer and a um, easy to uh, put on fly net. And of course, we make it sound a lot easier, but what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to set the line it on first and start to tighten that. And then fix the three bars across. You'll want the bars to end up in the center and with the help of a wrench and the socket. You're going to need a half inch socket and a three-quarter inch socket in order to put the uh, legs together. Again, you just want to, you're going to want to tighten this up so that it is um, solid within the center. All right, next step is Let's sneak over this way. Turn the tower over. Line up the whole thing. Oh, I think it looks like Don't you love live TV? It always makes it a little more exciting. <laughs> There should be three screws. Hmm. No, they were on the table. Of course, now they've gone missing. There's, some, right there was a There's some on the floor right beside you. That's the one we want. Thank you. Appreciate it. Washer over the screw through the hole of the leg, lining it up, pulling it through. And screwing it on. And you're going to do this all three times. 
Garden towers have been around now for about, well, this particular version, the, the Garden Tower 2, has been around since 2015. Um, it was created by a group of people in, on, uh, in the United States, and they were looking for a way to grow vertically, but still using soil, and um, being able to incorporate vermicomposting within the soil to provide natural nutrients for the plants. Um, Earth Connections became involved with them when they uh, did uh, crowdfunding or GoFundMe for what they're calling the Garden Tower 2, which is this particular unit that actually rotates and therefore makes it easier for people um, to be able to use the tower. Uh, they added a drawer to it to ensure that it was or to make it easier for people to remove the leachate or the compost tea and as a result be able to take that compost tea and put it back within the tower itself to continue to provide nutrients to the plants while they're growing. And it was pretty revolutionary. They, uh, they had done uh, the GoFundMe. They had it for I believe it was about 54 minutes before it was fully funded on GoFundMe, which was pretty cool and pretty amazing. We were, we were pretty excited. And my wife and I had come and a friend had come across the um, the GoFundMe page because where we live between Vance Boyd and Saskatoon, it's almost all sand. Um, in fact, we're eighty-nine percent sand, and so we were having difficulty in growing product um, to be able to eat. And this turned out to be a perfect fit um, for us. So we had ordered three originally on the GoFundMe, and when they arrived, within six weeks, we were harvesting fresh veggies, uh, specifically herbs, which is what we had grown first, and it was so neat and so wonderful and at the time i was working with flying dust and uh the river market garden and thought that this is just a great way for schools and for individuals to be able to grow themselves so we approached uh, the garden tower project and gave them an idea of what we were wanting to do and they thought it was great and at that time, we became the Canadian partner for the, the Garden Tower 2. So you're going to notice that I'm putting on the, the three caster wheels now. They're locking casters. And again, it's just a matter of screwing them on. And then we have to just tighten everything up. There we go. So the setup is, is very simple. You just need, as I said, uh, a half inch and a three quarter inch um, socket. And you can use a, a ratchet in order to tighten them all up. The nice thing about these uh, casters as well is that they're fully locking, so you can ensure that when you've got it set up, it's safe and that there's no chance of anything happening to the to the, the tower itself. When the tower is full, it's going to weigh approximately 180 pounds um, with, this, with the water and the soil in it. It will actually hold somewhere between 8 and 10 gallons of water within the tower, within the soil at any given time. And that makes it easier as well in the fact that it doesn't require watering on a daily basis. It's more of, you know, you'll be checking your plants and um, determining how much water it needs. When your plants are first starting out, so when you're, if you're gonna grow directly from seed within the garden tower, 
as opposed to using a full-on watering can, you're probably going to be better to use a spray or a mister in order to be able to put the, um, the moisture on the soil and not have the seeds go into 30 or 40 different places. Um, it's just a much easier way to get started. And you'll want to do that until the seeds have started to grow, until they have their third leaf. And that's when you're going to know that it's going to be there. Within the classroom itself as well, you're probably going to want to have some air movement to uh, assist the plant in becoming uh, stronger on the base. And when we get to the lighting portion, I'll show you how you're able to control the light for the tower and for whatever it is that you have growing in there. Um, each of the classrooms are also receiving a seed starting kit. And we will talk about that once we've got the, the tower um, set up in order to understand how to use that. The cool thing about this as well is that it can become interactive with the students in that if they happen to have green onions at home that have little hairs on the bottom of them, or they buy a romaine lettuce or a head of lettuce, if that is the bottom has been cut off, you can take those bottom pieces of your green onions or your lettuce or your celery, put them in water, um, usually it'll take about seven to 10 days. They'll start to grow the hairs and the roots from uh, the bottom of the plant itself. And then you can plant those directly into the garden tower as well. So it doesn't always have to be from seed. It can be using a product, using what you already have at home. And with green onions, you'll be able to grow them probably two or three more times um, and literally just cut them off and they'll continue to grow up as well. The lettuce is exactly the same with the romaine lettuce as an example. It's going to start to grow from the inside of that head and then make its way out and up. And again, you can choose to cut the romaine lettuce in when it's smaller, or you can let it grow up and get to the larger leaves. The cool thing about the garden tower is that you can grow just about anything in it. Um, when you receive your package, you're going to have a diagram or a planting diagram that gives you an idea of some of the things you can grow. So on the bottom, for example, you can grow things like squash and zucchinis um, um, and pumpkins and cantaloupes and things along that line that are going to be trailers onto the bottom. On the side, you can grow things like beans and peppers. Uh, on the top, you can grow uh, tomatoes. You can also grow carrots. But we strongly suggest that you just choose a small carrot, um, something like a Parisienne carrot. It looks like a round ball as opposed to a really long carrot because they take a lot of space going down into the tower, into the soil. And if there are other plants there, that could create an issue in having your carrots either become stunted or just not as um, long or tall as they could be. Um, so those are a couple of tips in, in dealing with that. When you're choosing varieties of tomatoes or beans or um, things along that line, you're going to want to ensure that you choose a bush variety of those plants rather than a vine variety. Um, basically, in a nutshell, a bush uh, tomato, as an example, is only going to grow from somewhere between 12 and 15 inches tall. And that's definitely more controllable within the tower itself. Um, choosing a vine variety, and I've made that mistake. Um, it was 13 feet tall by the time it was done outside, and that made it difficult to, to work with. However, being able to turn the tower still does help and make that work. So going back to the tower, now that we have the caster wheels on, I'm just going to take a moment and... Um, lock them to make it easier for moving forward. Within the box, you're going to have these center compost tubes. They really are simple to put together. You'll take the compost tube. You're going to notice that there's lips on these outside here, and there are holes within the tower on the next piece. And all you need to do is line up the tips with the holes and snap it together. Okay. 
and that's how that works. So we're going to do a little higher um, once we've gone a little bit further in the filling process. So the tower, the center compost tube will sit directly into the tower itself. It comes with rings. They're coming in, in a nested form. And these become the pockets of where you're actually going to grow the, um, the plants. So it's just a matter of lining them up. Down. And I think we will put this one on actually, just for make it easier for now. And again, you'll hear the click and that tells you that it's in. I'm going to put on one more of the nests. When the tower is fully set up, it's going to be about 44 inches tall. Um, and with the wheels, maybe 48 inches in total. The cool thing about these is you can actually have them go up 13 levels for commercial things. So if you were doing things like commercial strawberries, um, you could actually have the tower be almost eight and a half feet tall. Um, what will normally happen within a commercial application is they will have um, a ladder that's on wheels. It can be locked and people will climb up that tower or up the ladder. And then by turning, they're able to harvest right from in front of them so that there's no chance of having to move around. So at this point, when we have two sections and three of the center compost pieces in the tower, this is where we're going to start to fill it with soil. So a couple of things. If you're going to use the vermicomposting, then you're going to want to leave the center compost or the center tube without soil in it. Should you decide that you want to have or not to be using the vermicomposting right away, then you should fill your center compost tube as well with soil. Otherwise, you've got too much air within the tower itself, and that may prevent the plants from growing um, better. So for today's demonstration, we're going to work it as if we are actually going to have the red wigglers in the center. And everyone has received three bags of soil. Again, we choose to use um, an Omri or organic um, uh, version of soil. It's, it becomes basically a, a personal choice um, the key thing is that the soil that you're putting within the garden tower is not the same type of soil that you would find outside in your garden. It's specifically designed for container application. So it's lighter and it has, um, it's not as dense as your outside soil. Um, this particular one, the answer works really well. Yeah, it's available at Costco uh, when they have uh, their gardening. So which is, don't get me started on Costco and thinking about the fact that in January is when you're already having your garden stuff. And by May 2, 4 weekend, they're on to something totally different. But hey, you know, it's whatever works. So the soil itself, and I'm going to try and put it forward so that you can have a look. It has vermiculite in it. Those are the whites and it's a lighter type of soil so that it will allow um, better container growing. Easiest way uh, is literally to take your soil and put it into the tower and as you're filling the nice thing is, is that you can rotate the tower to ensure that you're putting it basically an equal amount within it. We like to start with just the three rings. And the reason for that is, A, it's a lot easier to be able to control where your soil is going. You'll notice we have a mat down um, just in case there's any spills. We do want to keep um, the contained vested in. Yeah. Oh, is that not in there yet? Well, gosh, Frank, you should probably do that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Otherwise, we're kind of defeating the purpose. You're going to notice on the front of the 
of the tower, there is a place for the drawer to go in. Let's see, I'm going to do that. And there's also a place for the tray. The tray is something that you're going to want to have left in the um, tower at all times until it's time to actually um, empty the compost tube. Uh, what we do with a lot of classrooms is really take a piece of tape, which is um, that come with the tower, and we just put that over there. It stops the kids from from pulling out the grate. If you pull out the grate, whatever is in the center compost tube would fall through into the drawer, um, which is fine when you're. Um, going to be removing the compost from within the tube uh, and using that for uh, nutrients within the tower. But in the meantime, you want to keep the grate on. And as you're watering, you're going to have the leachate or the compost tea make its way down through the soil and into the drawer itself. So when you're choosing to water, you'll always want to take whatever water is in the drawer first and use that on the top in order to be able to allow those nutrients to go down. Um, and that's going to provide continuous nutrients for the plants while they're growing. Thank you for the, uh, the help there. <laughs> All right, so now we're just going to carry on. We tend to do the soil in three section or three steps. So we've got the first two on now, then we'll put um, water into the soil itself and then do another two sections and water and then the third section and water again. You're going to notice as well that once you've got your tower initially set up, there's going to be some settling of the soil and there is some extra soil um, within the three bags just to be able to give it a top up so that you're not going to have um, gaps and holes within um, the tower itself. That's going to do us for I think. So now what's going to be important is that you're going to literally place your hands in the tower and you're going to be pushing the soil down and keeping it closer to the center compost tubes um, to provide some stability to it. The tubes themselves are snapped together so it's not like they're going to fall over or go anywhere, but it does make it easier um, when you're getting ready to plant. So within the pockets itself, you can see that as I'm pushing down, the soil is making its way outside or to the end of the pocket. And that's what you kind of want to see as you're filling it. And again, you would just continue to do this um, as you're putting the next levels on. So at this point now, what we would normally do is put in probably about a gallon and a half of water. That's going to settle within the soil itself, and that water will stay, be retained within the tower to provide um, water for your plants while they're growing. You'll always be able to tell how much water you need because you're going to start to hear the water drain into the drawer at the bottom. So that's a good way of determining how much water it is that you're gonna need in order to grow. Different plants are going to require different amounts of water. So as an example, if you're growing tomatoes on the top, they're heavy water feeders. They like lots and lots of water. So you may find that you're going to need to water your tower um, within an indoor setting probably twice a week, um, maybe three times. Again, it's going to depend on whether you have all your pockets filled with um, 
different types of seeds, things that grow really, really well within the tower, any type of um, herbs, uh, any type of lettuces um, grow really, really well. If you're looking for instant gratification because you don't want the kids to have to wait for months in order to see something turn into a fruit, a lot of folks will use some microgreens. So things like microgreen sunflowers or wheatgrass or radish or something along that line. If you place that in the tower in some of the pockets um, and put just a piece of paper towel that's moist and set it on top of it, leave it completely covered for the first three days, then remove that paper towel and then you're just going to spritz those microgreens. Within seven to 10 days, you can harvest them already. So that's really kind of cool. And the kids love to be able to take their scissors and, and cut off some of the microgreens from the tower and eat them right away. It's, uh, it's pretty neat, it really, really is. And they tend to like to bring in, as I mentioned earlier, some of their own green onions or lettuces or something along that line and watching it regrow, it's, it's magic. So imagining now that we have the soil in here, we've added the water to it. We're now going to put the next layers on. And again, it's just a matter of lining up the, the posts with the holes and they will literally fall right in and do that. You're going to notice within your box that you're going to have five of them that have the holes in it. These are specifically for the roots to be able to make their way into the compost tube. And the last one is a solid one, and that's for the top of the tap. So we're going to have these next couple. On the odd time, just through shipping or with the box itself, you may find that this compost tube has become slightly elongated or, or is a little bit wowed. If you literally just roll it like this within your hand, you'll be able to make sure that it's round again and be able to fit onto the rings. It works a lot better if you actually line them up. Um, you know, just a, an easy tip. Put on the next ring. And again, at this point is when we would normally add additional soil to the tower and the additional water. And again, the nice thing is that you can just turn it as you're adding. It's great for the students as well if they want to take cups and help pour the soil into the tower. It gives them ownership and it's a learning experience and they get to put their hands into the soil and it has lots of therapeutic benefits. I love horticultural therapy. We have uh, some schools that as opposed to just having the uh, garden towers in the classroom, they've actually put a half a dozen of them into their libraries. And that gives the kids the chance to decompress, walk around, um, spritz the plants with the water, and just, oh, it's amazing. It really, really is. The fifth one will go on. And then lastly, there is a top. And again, the top will just sit right in. You want to keep the top on for a couple of reasons. Number one is to remember not to pour water into the center column if you're watering the plants. 
Um, the little red wigglers, they don't require the extra water or moisture within the center compost tube. So it's just a good reminder that when you are watering, you're watering on the outside of the tower. And the hip, again, listening until such time as you start to hear the water coming out um, into the bottom of the, uh, the drawer. You're going to be surprised on how much water it actually takes. Um, it's, it's common that folks don't water enough. So you do want to make sure that you are watering to the point where you hear the water going into the compost tube or into the compost drawer. And again, don't be surprised on how much it takes. When your plants are first started within the garden tower, as we mentioned, you, if you're planting from seed, you may want to spritz um, with a mister around the seed itself. That will ensure that it gives the seed the opportunity to be able to settle and to grow within the garden tower itself. If you're planting seedlings into the tower, all you're gonna want to do is to form a pocket within the um, pocket itself, and then take your plant or your seedling, put it in, and then just take some additional soil around it to press it in similar as you would do um, if you were in a garden um, in order to be able to, to set the plant in. Again, a little bit of water helps as well when you're putting your plant into the pockets. And if you are doing the vermicomposting and you have vermicompost available, that's a great time to use some of that vermicompost to put it in to give that boost to the plants for their nutrients. If you're choosing not to do the vermicomposting to start with, then you may want to use some additional fertilizer, a liquid fertilizer, something like a Kelpman fertilizer, which is um, basically kelp kelp based. Um, it comes in a in smaller containers and usually needs to be diluted. You'll have to check the bottle. Usually, it's around twenty five to one um, for the amount of uh, kelp into it. And that's going to, again, help your plant to become healthy and strong. Within the um, classroom setting, you've also got lighting to be able to use. And what the lighting is going to do is going to provide that hit of natural light, except in the form of an LED, um, to help the plants grow. The cool thing about the plants is that when the lights are on, that's when they're taking the energy in. And when the lights are off, that's when they're using that energy to grow. So typically within a classroom and the setups that you have include a timer as well. The lights will normally be on somewhere between 12 and 14 hours um, a day. So what a lot of the schools will do is they will have the lights on basically when class is over or just before, and then turn the lights off during class time, um, just so that there's not the, the bright lights. It, these are, are uh, D neutral, so they're not going to create the funky, reddy, purpley, green colors. These particular lights are LEDs, and they are 80 watts, so they're pretty darn strong. What you're going to be getting is three lights for your garden tower. Again, they're going to come with these metal bases. They have a uh, little screw on the bottom. So you'll take your metal base. And again, there are instructions for all of this um, included with it. But you just take your stand, put the, the screw on so that it's tight, and then it will sit like that. The three lights that you're having, these are all, by the way, just for the world. Um, they're all inspected. They all meet the, the, the Canadian codes that are required for lighting within schools and classrooms. Um, they're literally diodes within, and they have a reflector, and they come with clips. So what I've done just to, for, for time saving is I put the two clips on. Again, you can set them in, and they'll literally click right on to the back of the light. And then you simply take your light stand, set up your uh, place your clips over that, and they will hang on to the light like that. Now, the nice thing about the garden tower is that, as I'd mentioned, sometimes you're going to have seedlings in there. 
And if you're just putting small plants into a growing medium, they're really going to stretch for the light and they're going to get long and they're going to get spindly and they're not going to grow as well as they could. So the nice thing about this is that you're able to place this light and because it's LED, it emits very little heat. Um, so you can actually bring the light close to the tower while the plants are growing. And then as they start to mature, you can simply move the light back. So if you're growing something like cabbage or broccoli or um, cauliflower in the tower, those tend to grow fairly large. Your cabbages can get fairly large heads on them. So you're going to want to make sure that you don't necessarily have another plant right beside it or that the plant that you're putting beside it is something that you can harvest fairly quickly. Um, something like a radish, as an example, is 28 days from the time that you plant it until you're able to pull it out. Beets work really well as well um, in that you can use the beet leaf um, for food as opposed to just waiting for the actual beet. So that's another option um, to put beside um, something like uh, a cabbage or a broccoli. Different types of plants, some of them require pollination. So it's important to know whether or not the tomato variety or the cucumber variety that you're wanting to grow within the tower indoors requires pollination. There are different types of seeds that are available. They're called paranthropic, and they will actually self-pollinate. So things like uh, our Roxananti cucumber, as an example, doesn't require us to specifically go in with a Q-tip or a paintbrush and pollinate it. The same thing is with tomatoes. A silage is a particular variety that doesn't require cross-pollination, but tomatoes are really, really simple. As they're growing and their flowers are starting to come up, literally just rubbing the plant and having the plant move um, will often be enough for plant to be able to pollinate or you can use a paintbrush or a Q-tip in order to pollinate your tomatoes, as an example, um, with your squashes. Um, and again, we strongly suggest that you throw those down on the bottom. They are going to require pollination with some form of a, a Q-tip or a paintbrush. And again, there are male and female flowers. Um, and I'm sure that you'll probably learn about that within your classrooms, or we do have resources available as well um, in order to be able to understand how to better pollinate those things. Different plants are going to take different amounts of time. So as I mentioned, things like microgreens can be harvested within 10 days. Um, things like radishes, as an example, are about a 28-day period. Um, a lot of folks will use um, baby leaf lettuces or something along that line, which can be a blend of different or what's called a mescaline mix. And they'll use that. Again, it's a somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 days. And when you're harvesting your lettuces, you're not literally removing the roots. You're snipping the lettuces in order to be able to allow them to regrow. Same thing applies for things like herbs like basil, as an example. When you've planted your basil, again, you're cutting the leaf of the basil off and still allowing the plant to continue to grow. There's basically nothing that can't grow in here. You may often want to find as well as to plant some flowers. Um, things like marigolds or nasturtiums are, nasturtiums are an edible flower. They grow well in the tower as well. And it just gives some opportunity for um, the ability to see different things growing within the tower other than just food. Um, there are places as well that use the tower specifically with air purifying plants um, as a way to literally clean the air within the classrooms. Um, so they're not using them specifically for food, but at the University of British Columbia, which is where they received a grant to do exactly that for some of their older um, buildings, they have them literally for the purpose of air purification. Uh, it also alleviates the potential of any 
um, need for allergies or for people that are allergic to certain things by doing just the plants, it's a safe environment as well. So that is basically the spin of the garden tower and the lighting. Of course, there's a light um, with the light. There is the cord and all of the classrooms are also receiving the timer to use for the tower and a three way cord to be able to make it easier to be able to plug the tower in. Again, 12 to 14 hours, set it on a timer. You don't have to worry about anything. It's done and it's ready to go. We're also including a seed starting kit. And what we have found with schools and classrooms in particular is that the easier it is for the teacher to make it happen, the more likely it is to succeed. And it's a really good opportunity to hang out with the kids as well and to allow them to put their seeds into the pucks. Currently, we're using pea pucks. We are now switching over to corn um, in our ability in our wanting to eliminate the use of peat within our growing. Um, but what we do have here still is some peat pot. So what each of the classrooms is receiving are two of these double thick trays, two of the domes, and of course the domes will be placed on, um, on the tray for growing. They do have a vent that comes with it, so you can open and close that just to allow the condensation and moisture to come out. Um, we also include the heat mat. Well, again, that's just great to be able to start the plants. Do check the back of your packages of your seeds. Some plants don't need a heat mat. Some plants don't want to be in the light to start with. So check on the back pack or back part of your seed package just to see exactly how they suggest you move it forward. But it does come with these um, heat mats. It also has a universal light stand. And again, that allows you to put the light down um, on the plant itself. And as the plants start to grow, you can raise that light up. Again, you want to keep the light close to the plant to start with so that it's not having to stretch. And usually it will take somewhere in the neighborhood of three-ish weeks before the seedlings are large enough in size to be able to transplant into the garden tower. What some schools will do, and again, they'll have one class start the seeds. They'll have another class plant the seeds within the tower. Um, they'll have another class go around and collect the compost from the, from the kids in the, in the school. Uh, they're green, so still there are things like um, your banana peels or things along that line. They don't like citrus. They don't like onions. Um, if you put an apple core in, you're going to grow an apple. So you'll want to make sure that you're taking the seeds out of whatever it is that you're putting into the vermicompost. Um, but again, it's it's there, there's a few key things about the vermicomposting. Number one, because it's within the tower, you're going to want to chop up those greens fairly fine. They love watermelon. They love cantaloupe. Um, it's, it's, they will flock to it. Um, but again, you're gonna to want to chop your greens up pretty fine and then place it into the tower. You're going to have about a half a pound to one pound of red wiggler worms to start with. So that's somewhere between 500 and 1,000. And red wiggler worms are not the worms that go fishing. These guys don't like to go fishing. They're perfectly happy just to hang out in the center compost tube. Um, they're, they're not your backyard buddies. Um, they are a specific type of worm that literally creates, for better lack of term, vermicompost, which is worm poop. Um, and it's incredibly nutritious. But with the vermicomposting, so you're going, if you have somewhere between a half and one pound of red wiggler worms within your compost tube, you're going to want to feed them probably twice a week to start with. And you're going to want to feed them about 12 to six. So basically a cup and a half um, to two cups of greens to start with as 
they start to grow and multiply, you'll be able to increase the amount of food that you're putting in there. Key thing is one part greens, so that's one part of your kitchen scraps, to three parts of browns. Um, so things like shredded newspaper, shredded cardboard, dried leaves. And it's really, really important. Greens in first, browns on top, because what the browns are doing is basically creating a plug or a place where the little red wigglers are gonna have their babies and they're gonna work with that. And it's going to prevent um, the chance of having other things like fruit flies, as an example, making their way into the tower. So it's one part greens, three parts brown. Within the lid itself, if you do end up seeing that you, for whatever reason, have let it become too moist or too wet, you can always add additional browns to it. Um, but if you do have some fruit flies or whatever the case, and it doesn't happen very often, and not if you're following the guideline, take a piece of pantyhose. You can put the pantyhose over the top of the lid and then just simply put your lid back on and that's going to prevent them from making their way out. Key thing as well within indoor growing is that you are going to not want to bring outside seedlings into the tower. Um, so you're always, always best to grow the seeds indoors. Main reason why is if you're taking seedlings from a nursery, you're going to find that they've been outside. They may have pests like aphids or whatever the case is. And when you bring those indoors, there are no predators that are going to take care of them. Uh, so it's really, it, it's just a really easy way to avoid the potential of bringing something into the tower, like an aphid, as an example, um, from getting it, having its roots uh, take place. If you do end up with aphids, and it can happen, um, there's a safer soap that can be used. It's a lot of work, and it does in involve some time in ensuring that you're wiping the top and the bottom of the leaves. Honestly, it's probably simpler to take the plant out and just dispose of it. If you should happen to have some plants that don't make it or pass away and are not successful in their outside growing, the cool thing is, is that you can still give them another life by putting them into the compost tube and allowing them to feed the rest of the uh, the, the plants that are, are surviving. Last thing with the, the, the seed starting kit, there are peacocks. Um, you have 110 peacocks that are coming with the seed starting kit. A seed starting kit will hold 55 peacocks in each of the trays. So you have enough to do 110 plants um as it starts uh and we strongly suggest that you don't try 40 different veggies at once um you're probably best to try three or four um things again try some that grow really fast so the microgreens are a really good start off experience um do your radishes do um again have the kids bring in some of their own to try and start with that and again, that's something that can already be started before the seedlings are ready to be able to make their way into the tower. Things like Swiss chard, kale, um, herbs such as cilantro, parsley, um, basil, all work really, really well. Again, from your planting guide, you can see that your tomatoes, normally on the top, but you can use your beans and your peppers uh, on the side and you'll stake them up as they start to grow. With the bush variety, it doesn't become really necessary to do staking, but if it does, literally a twig will work as a stake. Um, and then just using a twist tie, preferably a soft one, um, they're available at gardening stores, uh, just to keep the, the stem of the plant together. Again, lastly, uh, lights on, about 12 to 14 hours um, over the course of each day. 
um, watering until you hear the water going into the um, drawer in the bottom. When you're beginning watering, always take whatever's in the drawer first and pour that over the top. Um, for the smaller plants, as you're starting them out, a spritzer works well. If you're deciding not to do um, the vermicomposting, you will require some additional fertilizers of some sort. We strongly suggest um, organic fertilizer. Kelp man works really, really well, or some form of kelp tends to be really successful. If you do have your worms, um, they also require, we do it usually once a week, some eggshells. And you can take those eggshells and it's, again, my grandkids love it. You put them into the plastic bag, take the rolling pin, crush them up. And that's because the red wiggler worms still have a gullet and they still require some of that eggshell in order to be able to continue to grow. Um, if you're planting tomatoes, as an example, there are folks that will literally put a raw egg or an eggshell in the bottom of the plant when they're planting the tomato. That's going to give it some additional calcium. And you may find, even when you're growing your tomatoes within the tower, that they will require some additional calcium or calcium nitrate in order to be able to really grow well. Hopefully this has given you the opportunity to see how the tower goes together, how to put the lights together, the seed starting kit. You can have a turn with it and that it will give you the opportunity to have success growing with your students. And we're always available um, through phone and Tammy will have our contact information. And if you do have any other questions, um, for those that are online, if they, I assume you can do this chat thing where if there are specific questions, I'm still old school, um, but my grandson told me to make a point to let folks know that if they have a question, they'll know what to do and that we can answer them this way as opposed to just saying thanks and have a, a wonderful life. Um, and the same thing applies for those that are here with us today. Um, I will gladly open the floor and if there are any questions that you have. This is a great time. We have our first question. Potatoes. Potatoes. Potatoes are great. All right. But here's the deal. Three things. Number one, you want to choose a potato that is not going to get super duper big. All right. Number two, they do plant well without a problem. You can set them into the pockets to grow them. If you're going to try potatoes and again it does work i would strongly suggest that you put them near the top just because if your potatoes do like normally potatoes 70 90 days for growing um they're still going to get fairly large now you'll notice that the pockets they don't look super big but i've got a pretty big hand and i can easily fit into a pocket with a large hand so you are able to harvest them by hand, at least to the size where you can get them out. If they get too big, the only way to harvest your potato is literally going to have to remove the soil and take off a ring in order to get to them. And that's why we do suggest if you're gonna give potatoes a go, put them on the top. The same thing can go for yams. Um, you can grow those as well um, within the tower. I wouldn't, plant a garden tower specifically to grow potatoes year-round. There are numerous other options, but it is fun to grow a potato and to see it happen within a tower. Um, so yes, it's possible. It wouldn't be my first choice for the ability to grow back. It's a great way to start potatoes, even within a classroom, a root pouch, you put the, the soil in put the potatoes in they're going to start to grow their greens cover them back over deeper let them grow more and then you can pour your potatoes out so yes it's absolutely possible but if for the experience of seeing it happen absolutely but i wouldn't do a whole tower with it
any other questions from here or from the uh, the universe? <laughs> yes. You mentioned the the vermicompost. Yes. So I have two questions. Can sure. you go without the worms? And second, where can you get the worms? Okay. So yes, you can go without the worms. If you do decide to go without the worms, then it's definitely advisable to fill this center compost column with soil at the same time as you're filling the tower so that the entire tower is now filled with soil that's going to provide there won't be the airspace that could affect the growing of the plants but it will absolutely work with the soil on the inside worms are it's so cool there's a lady in saskatoon um her name is sandra and she has eco munchers so she may have some words available or worms available also there's the compost coaching folks and uh, a person in lisa house who will have access or know uh, have a list of places where worms are available you can check on kijiji you can check on your buy and sell um again you need about a half to one pound of worms to get started and they will multiply um we have community groups in in other areas where it becomes winter time and they don't want to kill their worms because anything below minus five will kill your worms that that's what they're good until so when the when the season is over that's when school is start so they will literally donate their red wiggle worms to the school until may or june and then the school will then have had the chance to have those red wigglers multiply so that the people can then take back their bit of the red wigglers and the classrooms will then have them moving forward the people are happy because their worms are happy and it's given the schools and the kids the opportunity to do the vermicomposting and then to carry back on again so it's there's a senior center um, and I'm in Orangeville, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name I'll add, but they actually work with a, a school so that the seniors will come into the class and the, the, the children have the opportunity to go to the senior center, and they do exactly that with the Red Wigglers every year. So it's kind of cool. Yep. I have a question that came in. Um, can you please explain how to clear the tube if the worms die or something like that? Absolutely. Great question. So the easiest way to now, rem I, I think we'll probably be all right, but we may see a little bit of um, soil come out. But all you're going to want to do is to remove this grate. So literally slide it out. And that will allow what's in the center compost tube to make its way into the drawer. And then it's just a matter of removing the drawer and having your compost come out of it. Now, if you end up having a whole bunch of roots within it, you may need uh, a broom handle, as an example, to push through. Um, compost cranks are also available to make it easier. But literally, the only place that your worms are going to be is within your center compost tube. They may go out a little bit, but not very much. They like to be where the food is. Um, so that's the easiest. So again, you take the screen out. When your screen is out, that allows what's in the center compost tube to come out and literally fall into the drawer. From the drawer, you're able to dump it out and put it wherever you need to. If you are doing this, you're going to, put, and again, this should be mentioned as well, it's important that your tower be flat and level um, within your classroom or within your school because water will travel wherever um, it can go when it's not level. So do ensure that your tower is level um, to avoid the potential of water. Some folks will use a boot mat that has about a one inch lip on it. Um, to set the tower on within a classroom. Um, there's also uh, folks that will use a water heater circle thing that you can get at PV Mart um, or a form of store like that to set the tower on um, for the potential of, of some moisture to happen because, well, 
it can. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it, but it definitely can. And again, within the classrooms, we strongly suggest a piece of tape. And also when you're setting it up, put this part where the tube is into the back corner so that it's not just sitting out and waiting for the opportunity to be pulled out. So somebody also had mentioned on there the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council yep, website. Yes. If you go on there, you can find more information about composting and where to get the worms as well. Absolutely, yeah, and they are they're awesome. I did my master composter course with them. Oh, I don't know, maybe eight or so years ago, and very helpful. And they're awesome folks for resources as well. Any questions? Well, thank you all very much for the opportunity. Um, there's lots of information that has been shared to make life easier on you. Everything that we talked about with the garden tower, um, as far as the vermicomposting, and also the setup of the tower that we had just talked about, they come in handouts and leaflets for you as well. Uh, planting diagrams of where you may want to put your different plants are there as well. Of course, all the setup instructions are here. And for the casters and the caster kit, there's also an instruction um, paper that's included with it. Um, if required, we have everything available in French as well, um, depending upon uh, if some of your school districts or it ends up being in a, a French immersion, we have all of this available in French too. When are the uh, Cree and Denny editions coming out? Well, that's up to you folks. That would, I think it would be awesome. I really do. Um, and that's, that would be amazing. Um, currently, we are working with 37 different First Nations within Saskatchewan um, in a variety of different capacities, from providing things like the garden tower um, to doing therapy gardens. Uh, we did therapy gardens uh, at the Women and Children's Crisis Center in Stony, as well as Kakawistaha, uh, Kisikus, and Cody First Nations. So there's definitely the, the possibility of doing that. Um, we are literally dealing with First Nations from BC um, right through to the East Coast, uh, as well as Alberta and in Manitoba as well. And of course, individuals and communities and senior centers and medical health places and mental health places. So there's a broad range of, of folks that we're working with. We did um, a project with Canadian children at Muskeg uh, and folks may have seen what they've done now at Muskeg with their permaculture and with their food forest. And it's amazing and, and awesome work. So it's coming and it continues. And the Riverside Market Garden here, Flying Us, is a prime example as well of the community of working together to grow food. Any questions online? I have one question. What is the total cost of this project? The total cost of this project? Yeah. Um, schools get a discount, first of all. So I guess I should throw that out there. Um, but Basically, for the tower, the casters, the three LED lights, the stands, um, seed starting kit, everything, it's around $1,000. The tower itself is $479, um, and there's lots of folks that will grow it outdoors and don't require the lighting. LED lighting is not cheap. It just isn't. But it's, yeah, it's in that $1,000. Well, thank you very much for presenting and helping us understand uh, the garden tower a little bit better. I think that everyone will feel a little more confident getting started. And if anyone has any questions, they can reach out to MLPC, to Steph at Saskatoon Public Schools, to myself, um, or to Earth Connections. You can just Google them online and find, find them. And I can also provide contacts. So thank Excellent. you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Everyone's gone. Yeah, okay.
right. We just want to thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Because ours is in a box still. Right. That's and why it's we very want to intimidating. <laughs> But this is this is we can do this, can't we? Girl? We sure can. Yeah, right. We can do this. Yeah, you That's made awesome. it look very very simple. Well, I've done hundreds. 